Got a very tight fit. I'm sure you can have a check. Let's see if you put this to that. You should vanish. Well, good afternoon again. I'm very glad that you're with us. I'm very glad to be here. And I'm looking forward to studying some more. I'm looking forward to opening the Word of God with you. And I appreciate the uh, point or two that Brother Zadok was making. Uh, I think what he was saying about the question and answers can be summed up in 1 Corinthians 1440. Let all things be done decently in order. Uh, we want to have good recordings. We want not to have confusion. But at the same time, we want to make sure you do have a chance to voice your questions, to share your thoughts. We want to get you involved, too. And I, I, I need you involved because I want to know what you're thinking. I'm, I'm very concerned. I'd like to invite you to kneel with me or bow your heads if applicable as we ask God's blessing, which we certainly need. I need. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much that we have this opportunity to study your word, to study your word openly. Uh, we're, we're not secluded in some little closet somewhere because of oppressive laws yet. But we know this time is coming. And probably the only Bible we're going to have is that which is in our minds. So we just think what... Uh, David said, thy word have I hid my heart, that I might not sin against thee. So help us to hide your word in our hearts this day, to have it there, not only intellectually, but spiritually, and to walk in that word. And I want to thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yes, two, two days ago, when we were leaving our house to go to the airport, we were praying for, for God's guidance and direction, and especially not to forget anything that was really important. And just as I prayed that, the Lord brought to my mind something that was really important that we had to pick up. And so he can answer our prayers. He answered your prayers. Even while I was praying just now, Something came to my mind that I hadn't planned to share, but I think it will fit in quite well with my prayer. And I want you to think about this. In Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4, we all know this verse. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. It's called the Shema of Israel, but it says hear. And if you couple that with Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, the Bible says faith cometh by what? Hearing and hearing what? But you know, in the Bible, the, the concept of hearing, it includes more than just receiving an audible sound into your ears and transmitted to your mind. We probably, I, I think in Kenya, as well as the United States and many places have been, have a similar kind of idea that when you hear something, that means to be in obedience to it. For instance, when I was a child, and maybe you had this situation, maybe some of you were parents, do this today. You, I was maybe being instructed by my father on a certain point, and when he finished instructing me, he would say something like, do you hear me? Do you ever do that? You, you hear me? That means, it doesn't mean, I mean, they spoke loud enough, you hear. <laughs> that means, are you going to obey? And interestingly, in the New Testament, one of the words that we translate obedience or obedient is a Greek word that means to come under what you hear. 
to come under what you hear. It's called hubakuo. It means to come under what you hear. And so if we want our faith to grow, brothers and sisters, we need to learn to come under what we hear and come into obedience to it. When we think about the righteousness of Christ and righteousness by what? Faith. We oftentimes think of faith as something that is just and maybe an intellectual assent or something that we learn. But friends, faith is living, it's vibrant, it's active. The Bible says faith works by love. Faith is active. And so when we learn things in the Word of God, for example, for example, now I can say this to you that something that some of these ministers can't say so easily to you. But because I have no vested interest in this, and you know I'm not coming to get your money, that's for sure, I can say this to you. The Bible says all the tithe of the land is the Lord, right? And the Bible says that we're to be faithful to that. Now, I read that, and I read in Malachi, for instance, where we've robbed him of tithes and offerings. I can read all these verses about bringing all the tithes to the storehouse. But friends, if I don't start doing that, if I don't incorporate, if I don't hear what the Word of God is telling me, how can my faith grow? On the other hand, I can look at the situation. I can say, you know, I don't have very much money. I can't even buy any meal for a golly. I have almost nothing. But I have a little bit. And if I return a tithe on that, I may not have enough to even buy enough of golly for my family. But you know, friends, when you do that, when you honor God, he will honor you. The Bible says that he will honor those who honor him. And when you do that and you see how then he steps in and he honors you, your faith grows. Your faith grows beyond just an intellectual capacity. So support these good brethren, these ministers, with your faithful tithes and offerings. And God will help your faith to increase. Now, we were discussing in our last session some about the need to consider Christ. He is the apostle of God, and he is the one sent to us. And there are about as many versions of righteousness by faith as there are Adventist preachers. I, maybe you've noticed that I have. Everybody's got a little different slant on it. But I know this, that in 1888, and even just prior and after that, God sent a special message to two men. Elders A.T. Jones, Alonzo Trevor Jones, and Elliot J. Wagoner. And Ellen White said as much as that, that God gave them a message for his people. And if we can stay close to the concepts from the Bible that they were teaching at that time, I don't think we have too much to go, to, to go astray on. But it's, it's a question that many have, how do I understand this better? How do I incorporate this into my life? But I want to remind you of a promise. If we could go to James chapter 1 and verse 5. And I didn't know. I, my, my focus was on you all last time. So do you know what you all means? It means all of you. That's, that's part of our dialect where I come from. Uh, my focus was on each one in the congregation. And I didn't know that they were putting the, the text up on the screen behind me. And uh, James 1, 5, there it says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God to give to all men liberally and a bride of thought. And it shall be given him. Now, that's a promise, friends. The promise has a condition. The condition is we ask in what? Faith. But faith is not only believing, but believing enough to do it, right? To accept God's word for it. And so if we're wanting to understand the issue of righteousness better, if we ask God for help, if we ask him for wisdom, he will give us that. And if you would turn with me to Colossians 2, 1 through 3. Colossians chapter 2, 1 through 3. We read here the, uh, the source of all wisdom. Colossians 2, 1 through 3. And here Paul says, For I would that ye, that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, and I'm reading that from the context, verse 2, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love and into all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I'm sure that somewhere in Kenya, 
they have a bank or banks that carry a certain amount of the national reserve of money. There may be bricks of gold there, there may be diamonds there, something to back up the currency to a degree. But there are places where these things are stored. Maybe some of you have some shillings that you put away under the mattress or somewhere at your home. And friends, when we're talking about wisdom and we're talking about knowledge, it's all in God and in Christ. And there's a type of wisdom of this world. There's a type of wisdom in this world, friends, that we don't need. In Romans chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. Romans chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. There Paul says, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination, and their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be what? They professed themselves to be wise, but they were actually what? Foolish. And you know what Psalms 14.1 says? It says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And so the wisdom of this world, friends, it, it, it says there's no God. You don't have a need of God. There was a, a, a Christian church in America that had a, a school, and some of the government officials didn't like their school. They didn't like what they were teaching. And they said, you know, what you're teaching, your what, what you're teaching these children, they're not going to fit into society very well. And the pastor said, well, you know, what we're teaching them is how to get out of this society and into heaven. And that society, you're not going to fit in very well with. So we have to decide whose wisdom, whose society do we look on. Also in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, going over from Romans to Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 24, there we are told that Christ the last part of the verse, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. He is the power of God and the wisdom of God. And in verse 30, it says, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. What a, what a range that is. Think about it, brethren. I mean, we who are ignorant are given wisdom. We who are weak are made strong. We who, we who are filthy and, and unpure are made pure and righteous in Christ. Now, in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 1, he says, Consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. And the book of Hebrews, it is a book about the sanctuary, the high priestly ministry of Christ. And it was brought out, I think, uh, by uh, Brother Sammy about the sanctuary. Also, there was, uh, I think, uh, Brother Anthony was talking about the need to understand the sanctuary. We need to understand Christ as our high priest. And in the book of Hebrews, Paul begins basically dedicating what we call the first and second chapters of the book of Hebrews to the qualifications of Christ being our high priest. The first chapter with his divinity that he must be able to reach god if he cannot reach and hold on to god he cannot bring us up to god the second chapter of hebrews deals with humanity that christ came all the way to the bottom rung of the ladder so he could save from the bottom up and i want to look at these two aspects for a little bit i think we have time to do that today and let me start early i don't know if they'll let me finish on time or make me stay to just an hour but they let me finish on the schedule time, I think we can do this maybe not otherwise. But let's turn to the book of John, and let's look at a text or two here. And, and, and these are Bible texts that we need not be afraid of. John chapter 1 and verse 1. John chapter 1 and verse 1. And again, it's a verse you can probably know quite well. John chapter 1, verse 1. It says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god now the bible uses the, the term god in about three different ways the bible uses the term god in about three different ways 
one way that it uses the term God is to, to define, to express the supreme being of the universe. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6, the Apostle Paul says, but unto us there's but one what? God. And who is that one God, he says? It's the Father, right? So the Bible speaks about that. The Bible also speaks about false gods, doesn't it? Speaks about false gods, Baal, uh, Moloch, things like that. False God. The Bible speaks about having the divine nature. Having the divine nature. In other words, having a nature like God. Jesus Christ is this word. In verse 14, it says, In the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That's John chapter 1, verse 14. It says, The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So clearly the word spoken of here in chapter 1 of John, verse 1, is Christ. But he is not the God. In fact, in the Greek it says the God. He is not the God, but it says he is God. And it means he is God in the sense of having a divine nature. Some of you are parents. You have children. And your children are just as human as you are. But they're not you. Christ is just as divine in the sense that as the father, but he is not the father. He is not the sovereign of the universe. That belongs, that, that title, that position belongs to the father alone. And even though the father has put all things at the feet of Christ, we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 28, in the end, that, he, that, that Christ turns it all over to the father, that he may be all in all. But here in this verse, we see that, that the son of God is spoken of as being God being God in the sense of being divine. Now let's go back to Hebrews chapter 1. I said in Hebrews chapter 1, we would have uh, Paul writing about the divine nature of Christ. And in chapter 1, I'm going to start in verse 3 and 4 here. In fact, let's just go back at the very beginning of the chapter. God, speaking of the Father, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in times past to the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Verse 3. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he hath himself purged our sins, sit down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he has in, as he hath by an inheritance attained a more excellent name than the angels. So there's a name that Christ has that the angels don't have. And it's because he's divine. But now notice verse 5 and 6. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Verse 6. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten of the world, it said, and let all the angels of God worship him. We are all to worship Christ. We're to worship Christ. He is worthy of worship. Do you find any other beings in the Bible, anywhere that are mentioned, that we are told to worship other than the Father and the Son? You don't. Because there are no other beings that we are to worship except the Father and the Son. We don't worship any of the angels. I was at a, a meeting at what is now called Southern University, Southern Adventist University, near College Hill, Tennessee. They were having, this was, this was in probably about 15, 16 years ago, they were having a symposium on the Trinity, the Trinity doctrine. And they, this was done by the Biblical Research Institute of the Church, and they called this meeting together, bringing in the best theologians of the church from all over the world, because they said they were getting more questions on the doctrine of the Trinity that they couldn't answer in any other subject. And they wanted to bring all these, quote, good minds in together so that they could come up with answers. So what they did, they took the, the most pertinent points and they gave them to several different theologians to write position papers. The man presented the position, pa position papers and then they let the floor be open for questions. So there was a man preaching on the role of the Holy Spirit in the book of Revelation. And 
he's talking about the Holy Spirit in the book of Revelation. And honestly, he wasn't doing too bad of a job. It was pretty accurate. He wasn't saying anything that really wasn't there. And I'm thinking, you know, I'd like to ask this guy a question. I'm going to ask him, if I get a chance to ask him a question, if I can get in line and make a question, I'm going to ask, where in the book of Revelation are we told to worship the Holy Spirit? I'd like to see what he'll say. But before he finished his talk, he said this. He said, I want you all to know that nowhere in the book of Revelation are we told to worship the Holy Spirit. He, he just said it right out. He said, we're not told anywhere to worship the Holy Spirit. And so I thought, well, he's asked my question. I, I better have a better question. And so I came up with a different question, got in line, got to ask my question. I said, I agree with your statement that nowhere in the book of Revelation are we told to worship the Holy Spirit. But where else or somewhere else in the Bible gets there a... We need to make an adjustment, yes? Okay. Okay. Okay, is it working better now? Are you getting it over here where you need it? Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. Maybe I don't want to speak so loud. <laughs> So I asked him, I said, where in the Bible are we ever told to worship the Holy Spirit? And, you know, the guy was just honest. He was up front. He said, do you know, brother? He said, I didn't come here prepared to answer that. I really don't know. He said, but we have all of these theologians in the congregation, and I know one of them has the answer. And so he's going to give the answer. And he got quiet to let someone stand up and answer the question. But you could have heard a pin drop in the room. Because they knew, as you know, there's no such teaching. But friends, there is a teaching that we are to worship Christ. We are to worship him and we are to worship the Father because he is worthy of being worshipped. And reading on in verse 8, it says, But unto the Son, he said, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. He's quoting from Psalms 46. And the Father calls Jesus Christ God. He gives him that status of divinity. You know, friends, we can be anti trinitarian and we can be very wrong. For instance, the Jehovah Witnesses. You know the Jehovah Witnesses. You know, they go door to door knocking, giving out their literature. They're not Trinitarian. And I've heard people say, you know, we're closer to the Jehovah Witnesses than we are the Catholics on the doctrine of God. And I'm not sure about that myself at all. Because they believe Jesus is a created being. They don't believe he's the truly only begotten Son of God. They believe he's a... a, a the highest and the greatest creation of God, who God adopted and called his son, but he's not really a son. And they don't believe that he is God in the sense of divine like we do, friends. We need to understand that if Jesus is going to reach the Father, he must indeed be divine. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, It says, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached to the Gentiles, believed on the world, received in the glory. Now, when you read that verse, as you begin to read it, you could come to the conclusion, well, this is speaking about the Father, because the Father was manifested through the life of Christ. But as you read on, the context would deny that kind of an interpretation. The context also tells us that this one who is called God was received up in the glory. He was here and was received up. That was not the Father. That was Jesus Christ. So Paul speaks of him here being divine. Now, that might bring to your mind a question. And how do we deal with this question? And let's go to Isaiah chapter 9 and 6 for that question. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now here, we believe this is prophecy about Christ, and it calls him 
the mighty God, and also the everlasting Father. So how can he be the everlasting Father? If you look over in chapter chapter 8 and verse 18, this is the cross of Christ, and it says, Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts, which dwelt in Mount Zion. He says, I and the children whom the Lord, and that Lord is all capitalized in your Bible, if you have a, a King James Bible at least. And that means it's speaking of the divine father. And in, in this case, and it says the father has given him children. So we are his children. He is the father of creation in that sense. And the apostle Paul in the book of Hebrews directly relates this to Jesus Christ. And so in that sense, he is the everlasting father, but he is called the mighty God as opposed to the Father, who's called the, the Almighty, the all-powerful uh, God, okay? Um, in Matthew chapter 1, another verse, and, and I hope that you're taking these references down, or you'll go back and look at the video later and make these references, because these are, are good references for you to have, because you may need to study this. I know many times um, when people find out that I don't believe in the Trinity, they say, well, you don't believe Jesus is divine. You don't think he's God. You don't think he's able to save us. But yes, we do. And if you've ever read um, the book, The Atonement, in the light of nature and revelation by J.H. Wagoner, he was the father of E.J. Wagoner. He stated that if the doctrine of the Trinity depended upon us believing in, in the divinity of Christ, if, if that was the only way you could believe in the divinity of Christ, he said, we would quickly become Trinitarians because we believe in the divinity of Christ. But you don't have to be a Trinitarian to believe in the divinity of Christ. In Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21, Speaking here about Mary, she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord, by the, by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is what? God with us. Not just simply the Father through Christ, but God with us. Now, I think every one of us has been in a situation where we've maybe been accused or we, we, we were up against some kind of a charge or a statement, and we're up against a, 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 a charge by someone who really doesn't understand the situation, you know. But the Bible speaks about judgment, and we're going to talk about judgment this week. Probably, I mean, no one else says I'm going to be talking about judgment this week. And we need to have a fair judgment, don't we? And in John chapter 5, I want you to notice something. In John chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, what Jesus says about judgment here. Now, we, we believe, according to, 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 to Daniel 7, 11, that the Father presides in the judgment. There's, there's no question about that. But in John chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, Jesus said this. It says, for the father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the son, that all men should honor the son, even as they honor the father. He that honoreth not the son, honoreth not the father, which sent him. We said that being apostle, being an apostle means that you are sent. Christ is the apostle of God because he was sent of God. But he will be the judge in the final tally because... He is the Son of Man, because he has come to live like we live, and it says here that we are to honor him in the same way that we honor the Father. In Micah chapter 5, in verse 2, we turn to Micah 5, 2. Micah, is that in the Old Testament or New Testament? Help me out here. Oh, it's the Old Testament? Okay. Good. Let's see, you have Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah. Micah, that's what that's right. Okay. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. It's a prophecy about Jesus. He says, But thou Bethel, Bethlehem Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of, out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from what? Everlasting or eternity. In other words, Whatever the concept of eternity is that we can understand, Christ has been there with the Father. Now, that's, that's not to say that he wasn't begotten of the Father. 
somewhere before time began, before we had this concept of time. Because if you look in, um, and I'm just going to, this is a little extra here, but if you go to Colossians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Here we go. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. Speaking of Christ, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him, that is by Christ, were all things created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions, principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. I was reading um, the book on the Sabbath that Elder M. L. Anderson wrote several years ago. And he was alluding to this text, and he says, this includes the concepts of time and space. Time and space. You say, well, how can there not be time, or how can there not be space? You know, because if they seem to be self-existing entities. But Andreessen said if they were self-existent, then they don't need God, and they are even, in that sense, equal with God. But even time and space, he says, have been created, brought forth by the Logos, by Christ, the Word. All things have been brought forth by him. And since he brought forth time and eternity is a measure or based upon time, he has been from all eternity. And yet there was a time, to use the manner of man, a time before time that Christ was brought forth. And he is the son of God. He revealed himself, we know, to Moses at the burning bush as the I am. The I am that I am. The self-existent one. The one in whom had life, original, unborrowed, underived the very life of the Father in him. In John chapter 8, if we could turn to John chapter 8, Jesus picks up on this concept of the, uh, the appearance at the burning bush. John chapter 8 and verse 58. He's asked the question, Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? And the prophets are dead, whom thou makest thyself. Verse 54, Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father that honoreth me, of whom you say that he is your God. Verse 55. Yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say, I know him not, I shall be a liar, like unto you. Well, I tell you, that, that, would be hard, that would be hard to listen to, Brother Sammy. You're a liar. He called those people um, hypocrites. He had, he had some hard words for these people, didn't he? Well, but, but you know, he said he couldn't lie. He had to tell the truth. And he says, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, thou art not yet 50 years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? And Jesus said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. You know, the Bible says then they took up stones to stone him in the next verse. They understood. They understood clearly he was claiming to be that I am that spoke to Moses in the burning bush. And if you go back to verse 24 now, verse 24, Jesus speaking, it says, I say therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am, you shall die in your sins. Now, you notice that I left out one word there. Or did you notice? What did I leave out? He. Why did I leave out the word he, do you think? If you look in your Bible, at least in my Bible, it is in what is called an italics font, an italics type. And that means it's a word that's been added by the translators, hopefully to make the text more clear. But sometimes it's needed and sometimes it may not be needed. But Jesus said, in effect, if you don't believe that I am, that I am the I am, you will die in your sins. People ask me all the time, they say, you know, do you think this issue of the Godhead, is this issue of Jesus being the Son of God, is it salvational? Can't we just all work together, preach the Sabbath, you know, get ready for the Sunday laws? But what does Jesus say? Because, friends, it's not important what I say. People ask me, you know, what do you think, brother? I don't care. You shouldn't care what I think about anything. You should only care about what the Word of God says. And Jesus says, if you don't believe that he is the I am, you will die in your sins. That's how, that's how important it is. That's how salvational it is. In Hebrews chapter 10, let's go back to the Hebrews chapter 10. And verse 12. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 12. It says, but this man, speaking of 
about Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sit down on the right hand of God. What is the position the right hand represents? Favor. It represents favor. He is in the favor of God because he is his son who has come to do his will, and he did his will, and he did it perfectly. In Revelation chapter 19 and verse 16, notice how Jesus is there described. Revelation 19, 16. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. I was in Brazil a few years ago, and uh, because um, because I'm not there now, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this. Um, but there were a lot of one true God believers. But they had this particular aspect of doctrine that they could not in any way acknowledge Jesus Christ to be divine. And I asked them, I say, you know, what does the Bible say about this? I said, you know, we, we read there in verse 8 where the Father calls him God. And the people would say something to me like, well, yes, the Father calls him God, but we cannot. We're not to say that. And, you know, the Bible says, Jesus himself says, the faithful and true witness says that we are to honor him as we honor the Father. We are to worship him as we worship the Father. And friends, if we can't worship him as the divine Son of God, we will not have salvation. Now, he has to be divine to reach God. But friends, he must be human to reach us. Because the Bible says we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God, right? By the way, does the Bible say that anywhere that you can think of? We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Is there an actual text? Where is it? It says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 23. Right. So we've all sinned and we've all come short of the glory of God, right? But friends, in humanity, there is one exception, if you please. Turn with me to Peter 2.22. 1 Peter 2.22. 1 Peter 2.22. It says, concerning Christ, speaking, if you look in verse 21, you see the context speaking about Christ. It says, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. So Christ is that exception, isn't he? He who knew no sin became sin for us, the Bible says. To emphasize this, to make sure that we get it, Peter says, neither did he have any guile found in his mouth. James says that if we can tame the tongue, we can tame the whole body, right? In fact, there's an interesting statement of Ellen White on health. Are you going to share that statement or can I share it now? She says that if we can conquer appetite, we can conquer every other sin. Appetite is the foundation of overcoming every, other, every sin. Think about that. Appetite was where we lost our, 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 our livelihood. And Christ came and conquered very first on the very matter of appetite. That was where his first great test in the wilderness was on. And he did that after 40 days of fasting. He did so you and I could do that too. But he says, neither was there guile found in his mouth. And if we contain the tongue, friends, we, we, we would certainly be a perfect man. But just how much was Christ tempted? In um, Hebrews chapter 4 again. Hebrews, please. Chapter 4 and verse 15. Hebrews 4.15. Very good. Now, Paul it uses like a double negative here in, in the way he starts this out. He says, uh, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. To put it in a positive sense, what he's saying is we do have a high priest who is and can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. You have bad things happen to you. Maybe someone in your family dies. You hurt. You grieve. Does Jesus know what, does he know what it means to grieve? Yes. 
Does he know what it means when when he's tempted? When you when you you are at the at the edge of just giving in everything? Yes, he knows what that means. It says that he was tempted, and he understands. And it says, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. It says in all points. In other words, friends, we might say today, well, you know, Jesus didn't have to be tempted with rock and roll music. Jesus wasn't tempted to drink the Coca-Cola down the street or whatever you know it might be. But friends, in principle, in principle, there was crazy music in the days of Jesus. There was alcoholic beverages and things that weren't good for you in the day of Jesus. There were women who wore tantalizingly lustful attire in the days of Jesus, too. In principle, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. He was tempted in every one of them to the fullest extent, so that when we are tempted, we can have victory over sin. And I, I mentioned that in the first chapter of Hebrews, we have the divinity of Christ, and in the second chapter, we have his humanity. And let's read some of these verses on his humanity in Hebrews chapter 2 now. And I'm going to start uh, in verse 14, Hebrews 2.14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, flesh and blood. What kind of flesh and blood do you have? Well, whatever it is, whatever you want to call it, however you want to describe it, Jesus had the same. You know, we use these terms, fallen nature, fallen flesh. Whatever we have, it said it also. He says he took part of the same. That through death, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. What kind of bondage were, were, were the people subject to? Bondage of sin. Jesus says, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Jesus said, I came to set you free. Not just free from human shackles, but free from the bondage of sin. Verse 16. For verily, for a verily means for of a truth. In other words, you can bank on this. This is important. For verily, he took not on him the nature of angels, but took on him the seed of Abraham. Now, within a lot of Christianity, not so much a lot of Christianity, because they sort of got this in their mind settled. Most evangelical Christians have this settled. But within Adventism, there is still a little bit of debate on the nature that Christ took in the Incarnation whether he accepted the fallen sinful nature of, of Adam or he took the pre-unfallen nature of Adam. Uh, nature, they, they have theological terms for it. And at one time, the church was unanimous in its belief. If you go back to the 1889 fundamental belief or the 1872 fundamental belief, it states there very clearly that Jesus took the fallen nature of man. And in the preamble to those fundamentals, it said, this is not set up to be a creed or, or to tell you how you have to live, but this is simply what we do with great unanimity, believe among us as a people. But in 1980, at the Dallas General Conference session, they rewrote some of the fundamentals, and they changed that to just sort of let it be whatever you want it to be. In fact, I was talking with a General Conference official a few years later, and he said that when the theologians got together, and he, was, he wasn't happy about this, so he was talk about. He said that when the theologians and Andrews got together to rewrite the fundamentals to be approved by the General Conference, he says, you've heard of double speak. You know what double speak is? It's like you say something and it appears one thing, but it can also appear something else at the same time. You know, we want to we want to appeal to the conservative wing of the church. We want to appeal to the liberal wing of the church. But he said they didn't do that. He said they did triple speak. He said they tried to write it so that if you were very conservative You'd say, yeah, you know, that's the old message, what we believe. And if you were on the liberal side, you'd say, hey, that's that's what we believe. We're right in there with the rest of the evangelicals. And if you're somewhere in the middle, you would see that in as well. And this is true. This, this happens all the time. People talk, they give studies, they write books, and they use this kind of language to try to draw in everybody and to make you think that they're teaching just what you believe. But friends, today, the church, the corporate mainline Adventist church, however you want to describe it, 
a church that probably very few, if any of us, are members of. They believe with great unanimity today that Jesus took the nature of Adam before the fall. But, you know, friends, I live with the nature of Adam after the fall. And I don't know how Jesus can come and help me. And even if he somehow could help me, I don't know that he can help me. When you don't think someone can help you, you don't have confidence in the situation, you give up. But the Bible says here that he took upon him the seed of Abraham. And I tell you, Abraham had fallen sinful flesh. Verse 17, wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliations in the sins of the people. He had to be made like all, all things unto his brethren. And verse 18, for in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor or to help. That succor means to help them that are tempted. Amen. So Christ can help us today. He can help us because he is that word made flesh. He is the one who came incarnate for us. Now in Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, in verses 3 and 4, Romans 8, verses 3 and 4. It says, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemns sin in the flesh. Why did you do that, God? Why did you send him for that? Verse 4 says, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Now, this says that he took the likeness of sinful flesh upon him. But does that mean that he really took sinful flesh or just something that looked like sinful flesh, but really wasn't sinful flesh? It's just like we have a screen here. And could we just put up, uh, up for a minute on the screen? So on the screen here, we're going to have a copy of, of, of Brother Wilberforce. Um, or something. Brother Sammy's desktop. But it's not really his desktop, is it? It's just a likeness of it. You see what I'm saying? It's a likeness of it, but it's not the real thing. And so sometimes people say, well, you know, this really doesn't mean what it says. This means something like it. But I want you to turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, because this is a text that we don't have any argument about. Philippians 2, I'll start in verse 5. Let this mind be a, let, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, some translations say the very nature of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. The, the Greek word that we translate reputation here means he emptied himself or made void himself, and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. I ask you a question, was Jesus a real man? Was Jesus really a man? I don't think anyone questioned that. But the word that we translate likeness here in Philippians 2.7, it's the same word we translate likeness in Romans 8.3. It means the very thing itself. The very thing itself. And so Jesus came and he dwelt in fallen nature. And he depended upon the Father day by day and moment by moment for victory over sin. You know, he said, I can of my own self do what? What did Jesus say? I can of my own self do nothing. Where's that found, by the way? Let's find it. Where do you think that is? Let's try the book of John. I got, I got something in my briefcase for whoever finds it first. John chapter 15 and verse 5. Let's go to John chapter 15 and verse 5. Let's go John 15, 5 first. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. And that is very good. And we probably come to that later. But it's not the text we're looking for. What was the text over here you had? Which, John 8, 28. Let's go to John 8, 28. John 8, 28. 
Here it says, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you shall know that I am he and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father taught me, I speak these things. And that's really close. That wasn't what we asked for. We asked for a text where he says, I can in my own self do nothing. John 5, 519, and also in verse 30, Jesus says, I can in my own self do nothing. I got a pen for you later. Remind me, brother. Don't, don't, don't forget to remind me because I'll forget. Um, it's a real nice little Bible work. So, so Jesus, he didn't come and take his own divine power and overcome by his own divine power. He depended upon the power of God. Because we are to overcome as he overcame. And we can't overcome as he overcame if he had something that, available to him that we don't have available to us. But he had nothing available to him that is not available to us. Now, do we have the power of God available to us? Absolutely, 100%. And we can overcome just as Jesus overcame. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things. Brother Anthony brought that up to us this morning. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens. 1 Corinthians 15.57, but thanks be to God which giveth us what? The victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Tonight, today, we can have victory. Today, we can overcome because we have a high priest who intercedes in the heavens for us, one who is fully able to, to, to meet with the Father, to meet with God on his level who knows what it takes to save us, and one who's fully able to come down and to meet with us in this room even today and understands every trial that we go through. He understands every problem that we have. He knows the temptations. You know, I've had people say, well, you know, the temptation was just too great, Brother Allen. I had to give in. But no, friends, the temptation is never too great. The Bible speaks about a group of people who will love not their lives unto the death. And I don't know if God has called you to be a martyr, but God is going to call people to be martyrs in the last day. I mean, we, we think of certain areas of the world right now, certain Islamic countries, certain countries where Hinduism reigns, and, and they don't take highly to Christianity. And sometimes Christians are killed in those areas. But I want you to notice the text in Revelation chapter 16. Revelation chapter 16. Just a second, we got a message here. We'll deal with that at the end of the message. Uh, where was I going? Revelation 16, is that right? Yes, Revelation 16. That was a message from Brother May, so I'll relate to it in a little bit more. I prayed about Revelation 16. Um, what's Revelation 16 about in general? Seven last plagues. Wow. You know, if there are seven last plagues, there must be some plagues before that. I think we're seeing some of the, the, the judgments of God falling upon the land right now. But... The third angel, or the third angel, has a vial in, in verse three. The second angel, rather, in verse three. The second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul in the sea died. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters say, and notice what the angel says. Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shall be, because thou hast judged thus. In other words, God, you're righteous in doing this. And here's the reason why. He says in verse 6, For they have shed, shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. Now, he's not talking about the people who ran the Inquisition in the 14th, 15th, 16th centuries. He's speaking about people living at that very last days of the moments of earth's history. And there's going to be people who have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and God's going to give them blood to drink. So we may be indeed, many of us may be indeed, called upon to give our lives for our Lord. And we will not be able to faithfully say at that time, well, Lord, the temptation is too much. I just got to give in. No, friends, we need to stand loyal and true. And we can do that knowing we have a Redeemer who can help us through that time. Jesus suffered through blood. 
he suffered through death for you and for me. And we can do the same for him, friends, because we have him, as Brother Anthony was saying, we have his life. Or no, I'm sorry, it's Brother Sammy saying about the seed, the seed that was in him, right? We have the seed of Christ in us, therefore we have his power, we have his ability to overcome all things. I want to do that, don't you? I want to be among the faithful. I want to be among the loyal. I don't want to be a traitor. I want to do what's right. And I have a Savior who is my high priest in heaven, who's making intercession for me right now. There's a text in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 I'd like to uh, bring to your attention. First Corinthians chapter 10 in verse 13. And Paul says, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. See, he's faithful. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that year in April. Amen. But will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. You know, that tells me one thing that's very important to me. And I think it'd be important to you if you get it too. And that is for any temptation. Now, give me, listen to me carefully. Before any temptation comes to you, God has already foreseen it. God has weighed out that temptation, measured it, and determined if you and your experience today are ready for that temptation. And if you're not, he's going to allow that temptation to come your way. But if the temptation has come your way, then praise God for it. Thank God for the hard temptations, because that means God has already weighed it out. And he says, you know what? Sister Sherry is ready for that temptation today. Brother Anthony is ready for that temptation today. I'm going to let it come his way because I want to provide grace that he needs to get through that. What a God we serve. What a wonderful Savior we have in Jesus, friends. Aren't you thankful for that? Don't you want to follow him closer? Don't you want to live closer to the Lord? If you want to live closer to the Lord, if you want Jesus to be your sufficient high priest who will make intercession for you, then I'd like for you to kneel with me as we pray and ask God's blessing upon our lives the rest of this coming. And also, Pastor Mesa, he's been in contact with some people in America that know about the situation with Jesus and what they've recommended for to him. He says that there's been, he's learned there's been an internal error in the, in, in the Kenya visa situation. And they're probably working on trying to rectify it now. And the best thing he says is just to wait. And so let's pray that whatever that internal error that, that, that the government has made, that it gets fixed. Okay. Let's, let's get it fixed. And, and let's get Pastor Mesa what he said. Let's kneel for prayer. Thank you. Our Father in heaven, how thankful we are that you are God, you are supreme, you're the sovereign of the universe, and we're thankful, Father, that you have an associate, a co-worker, one who fully understands you, one who is your only begotten son, who is in very nature God. And we're thankful that you allowed him to come to this earth, to walk in our footsteps, to be very nature human, to be truly human, to be truly divine. And I ask, Father, that you will allow him to do his intercessory work for us, that you will give him the ability to speak to us. I know you will because you want it, but just give us open hearts. Please give us, Father, the ability to, to, to hear your still small voice, to hearken unto your voice, not only have faith intellectually to know, but, but to trust in you so fully that we will put our lives in your hands, that we will be obedient, loyal citizens to your kingdom, day by day, moment by moment, building our faith, increasing our faith, drawing closer to you. There are probably issues in this congregation that I'll never know about, and they need you. And so I pray that you'll bless them with their needs. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.